Our scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 5, and it goes like this. One day Jesus was standing beside Lake Gennesaret when the crowd pressed in upon him to hear God's word. Jesus saw two boats sitting by the lake. The fishermen had gone ashore and were washing their nets. Jesus boarded one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, then asked him to row out a little distance from the shore. Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he finished speaking to the crowds, he said to Simon, row out farther into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. Simon replied, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing, but because you say so, I'll drop the nets. So they dropped the nets, and their catch was so huge that their nets were splitting. They signaled for their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They filled both boats so full that they were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw the catch, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Leave me. I am a sinner. Peter and those with him were overcome with amazement because of the number of fish they caught. James and John, Zebedee's sons, were Simon's partners, and they were amazed too. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. As soon as they brought the boats to the shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peter is one of the most important people in the Bible. And we don't talk about him all that much. I know that my Sunday school class did not involve um, three months of tracing Peter's journeys through the Mediterranean on a map. We spend a lot more time talking about Paul than we do about Peter, but Peter is by far the most important person besides Jesus in the New Testament. Now, Peter has four names. Four. So the first one in his native language of Aramaic was Simeon, which means obedient or the one who listens. Now, if you've spent any time with Peter, obedient and the one who listens is not the first verb that you would put with him, right? Simeon in Aramaic gets translated into Simon in Greek, which is why we know him as Simon, because the New Testament is written in Greek. Peter is given the name Peter by Jesus later on in the ministry because Peter would be the rock on whom God builds the church. And Peter in Greek means rock. And they translated that back into Aramaic, where we sometimes hear him called Cephas, which also means rock. So you may at any point in time encounter Simon, Simeon, Peter, or Cephas in the New Testament. It's a total of 181 times that his name is mentioned in the New Testament. That's a lot. So you would think Peter would be our hero of the faith, right? The one we build named churches after, the one whose statue we raise, the one who we refer to in our theology all the time, and yet Peter, for some reason, is made a second-class citizen in the ministry of God. I think it's because we like our heroes to be infallible. We like our heroes to be confident and sure of themselves and full of vim and vigor and truth, and so we like Paul, because Paul is never one to admit that he made a mistake, or they didn't know something. If you came up to Paul and asked him a question, he was going to give you an answer, whether he knew the answer or not. It was going to be fully formed and take three pages, right? We like that kind of hero. Peter, on the other hand, is so incredibly human. So incredibly human. The stories we know of Peter from the Bible are ones where he doubts. Where he doubts Jesus' leading. The one where he asks questions of Jesus, where he is yelled at by Jesus. The Peter who is never quite sure what the heck he's doing here. The stories we know of Peter in the Bible are the ones where he denies Jesus. It's a shame that his best known story is the one where he is the weakest. And it tells you something about who the Bible thinks is important when it lifts up somebody like Peter. 
So in the next few weeks, we're going to spend some time talking about Peter. Now, Peter was born in a town called Bethsaida. Bethsaida was an itty-bitty, tidy town on the Sea of Galilee. The only thing you did there was fish. It was a fishing village. They have discovered it. They've uncovered the town of Bethsaida, they think. And all they can find in there are things like fishing hooks and fishing nets. All of the artifacts are fishing related. And so it was a small company town on the side of a lake. Everybody there fished or was fishing adjacent. And Peter, who was married, because we know he had a mother-in-law, we heard about her last week, had his own house. It was in the same courtyard as the temple, so we know he was an observant Jew who went to synagogue. He owned his own fishing uh, business with his brother Andrew. He probably inherited the boat, so it's a second generation business at the very least. And he shares that business with two other disciples who we know as James and John, who are the sons of thunder, which is my favorite disciple name. Can you imagine what that boat was like, by the way? You got the sons of thunder and Peter, who was not known for being meek and mild, and Andrew, who um, is like the sarcastic buddy sidekick in the Bible. What that must have been like, I don't know. But anyway, they owned this boat. And what they would do every day is they would take their nets out into the lake and they would cast their nets over the boat. Now, this was a giant net. It took four people to cast this, four grown men to cast this net. So it's giant. On the top of the net were floaters and on the bottom of the net were weights. And so when they threw it, the net would float on the top and then sink down like that, right? And make a giant fish wall. Now the fish would fish in, run into it because they're fish who they can't see, right? Which is what all fisher people count on is the fish being not as smart as they are. The fish would run into the net and they would row their boat parallel to the shoreline, right? So they would go like this, and they would drag the net along behind them and take the fish with them. And then at a moment's notice, they would turn the boat away, and row right into shore, and then drag. And the four other people who were on the boat would grab the slack lines and pull it into the boat as they rowed. This does not sound like the kind of fishing that my family does. We go to the side of the lake, we take our cooler, There's some ice in the cooler. There's some beverages in the cooler. I take a book because I don't fish. And my husband stands and casts a line into the water. And before we had kids, this was like an all-day activity, right? We'd get up at 4 in the morning, and we'd go fish all day. And we might come home with a fish. Because that wasn't really the point of the fishing, right? These guys needed the fish. Their life depended on fish. They would take in the fish into the boat, and then their day was not done. They had to sort, hand sort the fish to which ones they would like to keep. Then they would row the boat to the other side of the sea where they would sell the fish. It would get hung in dry storage and then eventually shipped off to Jerusalem. Also, did I mention that they had to pay taxes and fees on every step of that? They had to pay harbor fees. They had to pay fees to be in the lake. They had to pay fees when they caught the fish. They had to pay taxes per fish that they sold. And the tax collector that they went and saw, Matthew. So we're already starting off with five disciples who are fishing related. Four of whom don't like the other one because the tax collectors were known for just deciding whatever the tax was that day. I like the look of your face. You get to pay me five. I don't like you. You get to pay me ten. And I'm going to keep the extra. They needed fish. And so when we meet Peter and his brother Andrew and John and James today in our story, they'd had a long, frustrating day with no fish, which means no dinner which means no food, which means they have to pay taxes out of something else because they have to pay them whether they catch the fish or not. It's a hard, hard job in an environment of oppression by the empire who could at any moment decide not to let them back on the water. Peter is not a stranger to Jesus. When Jesus sees Peter on the shoreline, they have already spoken several times. 
Peter would have known who Jesus was. Jesus was by now an itinerant, famous preacher in Galilee. People knew who Jesus was, and they were chasing him around the countryside. And so when Jesus stands on the shoreline and says, Peter, Peter, let me in your boat, Peter says, okay, I guess I haven't done anything else today. I didn't catch any fish, so maybe this guy will give me some money for using my boat for the equivalent of what is a first century sound system. You stood on the boat because the water carried your voice farther. So Peter lets Jesus stand on his boat and preach a sermon and then sit on the jump seat in the back in the hopes that he will pay ferry passage to the other side of the lake. It is a situation where Jesus needed Peter as much as Peter needed Jesus. Jesus' favorite part of ministry was never preaching to the crowds. He never liked to stand in the middle of a bunch of people and talk to them. He was much more a hands-on kind of gospel guy. He worked with the people. He preferred the healings, the quiet moments in the houses, the times when he could engage with people. And so he is always running away from the crowds, always running away from the crowds. If there's any story in Luke that he tells about Jesus is that Jesus is in the midst of a crowd and then tries to run away and go somewhere else. And so Jesus needs Peter to take him away somewhere else. And so Jesus needs Peter as much as Peter needs Jesus. And so when Jesus says to Peter, why don't you cast your nets over the boat one more time? It's not like Peter's at, uh, Jesus is asking Peter to like, have a cup of coffee. It had been a long, frustrating day. Peter had spent all day not catching any fish, and this itinerant preacher who's the son of a carpenter is telling him that maybe if he just tried one more time, it would be okay. So Peter hesitates. He says, Jesus, we've been fishing all day, and I'm tired, and we just cleaned the nets, and the fish aren't here today, and so Maybe another day we can catch some fish. And Jesus somehow conjoles Peter into casting the net on the other side of the boat. And of course, Peter catches fish. And I think it makes Peter angry. I think it makes Peter upset that Listening to Jesus, doing what Jesus asked him to do, actually worked. <laughs> Jesus isn't supposed to know what he's talking about. Jesus isn't a fisherman, and Peter had spent all day catching these fish, his whole life catching these fish, his whole family catching these fish, and this guy comes, catches a fish on the first try. I would be angry. You know how you've had times where you, something's wrong with the computer that you're working on, right? You just need to print this document or whatever it is. You just need it to work for like 10 seconds so you can do whatever it is that you need to do. And you've been struggling with it for half an hour and then somebody comes in the room and you say, will you fix this computer? And it takes them four seconds to do whatever it is you've been spending an hour to do. You know what I'm talking about? And doesn't it make you angry? <laughs> And so Peter tells Jesus to go away. <laughs> go away. Go away. You are making me angry. You're making me upset. You're making me doubt my ability to fish. And Jesus says, dude, it's okay. I'm going to teach you how to fish better than you've ever fished before. I'm going to take you out of this boat and into a life of ministry and service to others. And Peter is afraid of what that means for him. And it's so easy to judge Peter for that. I think we all like to think that we would have jumped right out of the boat. There's a miracle catch of fish. We've seen a miracle happen, and I think we all like to think that we would have instantly jumped off the boat. But I'm going to tell you that even if I saw that miracle of fish and all of that stuff, I'm going to question this guy for at least a minute. What do you mean, get off the boat? What do you mean, fish for people? That doesn't make sense. You can't catch people in a net. They will arrest you for that. 
What do you mean, get off of this boat? I don't think you know what you're talking about. I don't think you know what you're doing. I'm not getting off the boat. How am I getting off the boat anyway? We're in the middle of the lake. This is not yet the time where Peter jumps off the boat and tries to walk on water, right? We're not there yet. This is the first step of faith for Peter. Is he willing to get off the boat? Is he willing to follow this itinerant preacher who was telling him crazy things, things that are different than what he'd always heard before? Is he going to get off the boat? And we know the end of the story, and so we know Peter does eventually get off the boat. But all of us have these moments, these times in our faith journey, where we have to make a decision about whether we're going to get off the boat. We're going to be journeying um, through a book together during this season. It's called Faith After Doubt. It's by Brian McLaren. Um, you can come and check out my book later if you want to read it along with me. But he talks about something that's called crisis or faith stages. That there are predictable stages to our experience of faith that, like Peter, as we'll see, we tend to grow in our faith over time, or that's the goal. And the only way that we can grow, he argues, is to experience a crisis of faith. You have to experience a crisis of faith in order to grow into another step or to move into another stage of faith. Peter has grown up in the synagogue. He knows the laws of Moses. He knows what he's supposed to be doing. And yet Jesus comes in the boat and he has a crisis of faith where he has to make a decision about what he's going to do next. And every one of these crises, when we experience them, come along with questions. They come along with doubt. They come along with um, curiosities. They come along with exploration. It hurts. It's painful. It's not an easy walk to go on. But you have to go through it if we're going to get out of the boat. And so all of us have had these times in our life, whether it's been because of a diagnosis, or because something has happened in our lives that's made us question, or because other people have done something that has made us question the, the, the bedrock of our faith, of what we'd always been taught to be true. We see this happening all over the place when people move to a new location, and they have a crisis of faith. Who are they now in this new place? Or a loved one dies, and they don't know who they are in that time, and there's often a crisis moment. And crisis doesn't mean danger. It just means something where we have to make a choice about what's going to happen next. We have to decide if we want to get out of the boat and into the water where there is chaos, where there is danger afoot, but where the wind is moving. It happens to all of us, these moments, these times where we aren't sure of where we sit anymore with our faith. And we can choose to stay in the boat. We can choose to sit in those places and to give up altogether. Or to go back to a simpler time where answers were easier but yes, less satisfactory. Or we can choose to take a step of courage forward with Jesus, who promises that you will be caught. He's not going to leave you in the water. And so Jesus asks us to put down the net, to maybe stop trying so hard, and to sit sometimes with the uncomfortable Ness, to sit sometimes with the questions and to see where they lead us next. And so I invite you to come with me on Peter's journey as we see where it leads him next. And to ask yourself where you can see yourself in his life story, the very human Peter, who is for all of us an example of what faith really looks like.
messy and complicated, secure, all of those. You have to choose to get out of the boat. Amen.